What's up, Crypto Crew, and welcome back, or if this is your first time, I'm Captain Crypto Might, actively escaping the Matrix, scoping out the crypto ocean, so if you like your odds, get on the boat, stay up to date, thumbs up, and join the hunt. Into the boat! Crypto Crew, now we all know Caspa continues to be steady building. A lot has been made of Dac Knight being Caspa's endgame, but as of lately, one of the topics that has come up a lot is the topic of VProx. In today's video, vid caspa core developer michael sutton will explain what vprox are and what this means for caspa and the entire crypto ocean moving forward taking clips from michael sutton's latest interview with ankit of the xxam podcast shout out to them don't want to miss out on this because the future of caspa the future of crypto is about to start i guess you guys aren't ready for that yet prove all things Hold fast that which is good. Protect your Casper coins and other crypto investments by practicing self-custody. And in our opinion, the Tangent Wallet is your best option. Plug and play, easy to use, and the most affordable cold storage out there. Get 10% off using code CryptoCrew with the link in the description box below. Thanks so much for your consideration and support in advance. And may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you all. When you call a smart contract uh, on Ethereum, you sign your transaction calling some smart contract. Why do you do that? Because you know this smart contract has a hash and you verified either socially or, or by your own eyes that that contract has logic that doesn't steal your money, um, but actually will swap for you a token with another. So you know that contract is sound, meaning it, it doesn't take funds from people. It, it goes by uh, specific rules takes like the exchange ratio and then forms a swap. And then you call that contract with, with a, some kind of ID and you sign it, so you're good. So same thing would happen here. You would sign a transaction calling a specific program. Mm. And the ZK prover would have to execute that program, which is encoded in this hash in a similar way to what I described, in order to advance the state uh, on L1. L1 doesn't know the full state, but L1 knows like the Merkel root of all the state or some kind of commitment. And the prover is going to tell the L1, okay, you can advance the state from this state commitment to the followed state commitment because I'm showing you that I executed the program correctly. And that's the um, the updated route. And then obviously someone else can show you uh, versus that route, like what's your updated state within the uh, actual state tree. But the ZK approver actually proves exact execution just as if uh, an if L1 executor would execute that yeah. contract for you. ZK proofs are similar to tamper proof seal letter. You know, in the old days, mm -hmm. at least you used to have the tamper proof seal and then you trust the content mm -hmm. without reading every word because of the seal. So mm -hmm. I think of that like ZK for mm -hmm. me has been that type of technology where you know, you can trust the seal um, and that lets you sort of verify the correctness on chain uh, without... Yeah, it's, it's worth mentioning that ZK itself is a kind of slightly misleading originally in this context. A more accurate term is validity proofs because we don't use the zero knowledge attribute of these proofs. In cryptography, when you're saying I provide a zero knowledge proof for something, it means that I can prove to someone that I solved some problem without leaking any information that how I solve the problem. So obviously, if I share the solution with someone, say, think about a graph problem, like some computational problem, someone is asking you to solve an exponentially hard problem of a uh, graph coloring. So if you provide the solution, anyone can verify it uh, in linear time, it's very easy. But you want to show someone you have a solution without leaking the solution. The solution is, is, is uh, it's precious to you, I don't know. So that's where zero knowledge, that terminology comes from. In blockchains and proving uh, valid, valid computations, we don't really care about not leaking how we computed those programs. Anyone can compute those programs. It's a public knowledge. So there's no real caring about that zero knowledge, non-leaking part. That's related more to privacy technology. I see. So the leaking part could be the transaction, the balance, the addresses, like those are the parts that in this case we don't care about. Yeah, I'm not an expert, but I think that the fact that the zero knowledge proofs valid for validity proofs don't need to avoid leaking information, it must simplify the cryptography in one way or another. Why choose VProx over EVM or perhaps even over other traditional virtual machines, right? Many, many other 
blockchains have ended up building their own VMs, right? Uh, why to go that go down this route? Vipog's ambitious goal would be not to choose a VM, actually. It's saying like each Vipog can actually be built with a different um, style of, of VM. It's not so easy to support many technologies. And also, I'd say that Vipogs have merit even if you choose one technology because the, the sovereignty versus composability attributes are relevant also if it's exactly the same technology. Even if you know exactly how to execute all programs, it's the same interpreter, the same VM, etc., you still don't want necessarily to execute all other programs. Obviously, Vipogs are going to come with one or two selected VMs, hopefully two, because we need Two would mm. already bring the flavor of not being one and would already introduce enough challenges. So hopefully two. But once you have two, you can have more. But there could be different VMs essentially across different VPROCs, right? That's the aim here to have EVM versus Rust or like different people yeah. running different VMs. So EVM itself would be slightly not natural for VPOs, but it possibly can be adopted as an infrastructure, but it should still adapt the thinking of contracts as a provable unit uh, with a dedicated covenant on L1 and not like group many contracts under one executor. Because that's kind of the idea, a one-dimensional space where folks only compute each other when they need to, but they can still compose. Right. I'd say you can somehow adopt EVM as a template for each fork. Think about a programmer deploying, wanting to build a smart contract. Ideally, in the future v VPOG world, it can choose a template. Okay, I want to go with Solana style um, ELF contract, org. So I'm using Rust and I'm building like a Solana like program. And there's a specific prover network that knows how to prove my program. But it's more like a template and not going into a group of contracts logically but more choosing the infrastructure template. Coming from Solana ecosystem and they want to build on Vprox, like they have a way via these templates perhaps to build. Or someone coming from Solid, like Ethereum knowing Solidity, right? They can all build on Vprox um, using their own VMs essentially, right? Right. So EVM would be less natural because the way Vprox are designed, you have to explicitly say what accounts you're reading and writing to. And there's kind of no, that progs themselves are stateless. It's not by chance that it's Solana inspired in a sense. What Solana did maps naturally because Solana was thinking about programs as kind of black boxes. So a black box, a stateless black box, which can obviously there's accounts that only this pro owning program can write to. That's where it can maintain its state. And every transaction declares exactly what it reads and what it writes to, which allows building some kind of computational DAG. And programs wanting to call each other cannot like um, assume compiler compatibility or stuff like that. They have to actually serialize uh, their call. Program doesn't know much about another program except for this convention of how to call it. They did it for conceptual philosophical reasons of they wanted a more uh, low level program-oriented system, that's my understanding, as well as all, all kinds of performance uh, considerations. It happens to be that ZK fits to this more naturally if you want. That's why we also called it verifiable programs and not verifiable contracts. You know, everyone has been wanting the smart contracts on layer 1.5. There's been a big debate. Base rollup is layer 1.5. Uh, do you think uh, VProx is fits somewhere between or is still, is it considered to be 1.5, 1.25, somewhere even better? Or is it layer, I mean, it's not layer 1. <laughs> <laughs> the intention here is that L1 remains the hub of folks. You deploy them on L1, you obviously execute them not on L1, but they, we want, because they're atomically and synchronously composable, the experience should be as if they are on L1. That's like the user experience and the dev experience. Aim is that it should be like this unified space. And in that sense, you want to say they are L1. They are very native, like L1 is doing a whole lot of effort Mm. to maintaining information so that they compose, okay? So the fact that L1 technically isn't executing, it's still doing so much to create this unified one-dimensional space where everyone can interact with each other. Hopefully it, it creates the feeling uh, of an L1. So it's a part where it might be challenging to create the feeling of an L1 and that it seems like at the very least you have to bridge. So once you have atomic composability or synchronous composability, you can think about an asset hub. So think about a, a standard special program, yep. which implements most of token management, minting and stuff like that. So the, the Solana has an SPL. 
uh, which it does uh, exactly that. So this this standout program, and there's one single liquidity space or entity that everyone can compose with it. That's where you get uh, unified liquidity. If you want to bridge Casper to the L2, you still have to somehow move it to the L2 space. If you sign a transaction on L1, you're signing the inputs. Essentially, you, you're proving also to the L2, you're authorized to use these addresses that happen to be the L1 UTXO addresses. So an L2 can look at this and say, okay, so this transaction was signed by this address. L1 verified it. I don't need to verify signature of this signee. Let's say that the intention is to somehow create the most unified experience even across the L1, L2 boundaries. Crypto Crew, hopefully this made sense and hopefully planned a seed of the direction the crypto ocean will go into and what potential role Casper can and possibly will play. Let us know your thoughts on VProgs and the potential impact Casper will have when rolling out this tech in the comments below. More Casper content coming in a vid near you. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Stick around. Fix your mind before you get to the grind. And with that said, let's continue to escape the matrix. Let's continue to be on the lookout for the next big thing here on the crypto ocean. Grow in grace and let's make some crypto waves. Say ah.